also in the regime in which uh, strong self-action effects take place. And here are just a few examples. This is just for fun because this was the thesis topic. But just for fun, depending on exactly the power in your laser beam, how you focus it, uh, where you put the focus with respect to the input window to the cell, you can get any sort of this, any sort of behavior. It can collapse into a fil single filament, multiple filaments. This would, this would be what I would call small scale filamentation. If the light goes through a tilted glass plate, you put a deterministic structure on the beam, and, uh, you, the, and it's no longer a random looking pattern. You can determine the structure that will show up on your, on your laser beam. This was uh, something that happened a few years later. Uh, student uh, Ryan Benning uh, goes out of the room, comes back, he looks at the wall, and there's a hexagon pattern. Uh, and then he changes the conditions slightly, and he sees a called roll pattern. Uh, so this is very strange because usually a small scale uh, filamentation leads to this highly random type of pattern. But what we found here is that if we adjust the boundary conditions just right, the beam will b uh, break up into a well-ordered uh, structure. Always, once you understand something, it's not as complicated as you thought. If you adjust the laser beam so it breaks up into three spots, well, take the Fourier transform of three spots and you get this. Uh, now instead, adjust the power of your laser beam so it breaks up into two spots, take the Fourier transform of this and you get that. Uh, so that was our explanation of what was going on here. Now, Marty Karn, uh, who was one of my former students, and is Miko here? And the PhD thesis supervisor, Miko, uh, I won't try to say your last name. <laughs> Marty was in his fifth year of graduate school before I could try to pronounce his Finnish last name. Okay, so, so, th th so this is, uh, uh, so here's the experiment. Take two laser beams, let them cross inside of a sodium cell, and then a forward four-wave mixing process can take place, and this can be phase matched under the conditions that we show here. And so what this means is that the, uh, here are the two transmitted laser beams, but you generate a cone of light surrounding these two beams which we show here. You then put in a third beam and you get three rings. Marty desperately wanted to make an Olympic symbol, but he was never able to find exactly the right boundary conditions to, uh, to do that. Uh, this is something still more recently. Uh, we've found a way that we can degrade the spatial coherence of a laser beam. So a uh, spatially a coherent beam goes in. This is small scale filamentation, but we arrest the process before it becomes fully developed. So coherent light in, incoherent light out. Why would you want to do this? There are people who want to build laser power limiters so that uh, you don't burn up uh, sensitive components like the retina of your eye. So, so, uh, so many people are trying to build power limiters. It occurred to us that maybe uh, the radiance is, is, a, is a equally important, if not a more important quantity. Radiance is one of the fundamental radiometric units. The radiance tells you what the intensity will be at the focal region. An incoherent beam of light cannot be brought to a small focus. A coherent beam of light can be brought to a small focus. So really what we had done here was to be able to control the radiance of the beam of light using controlled self-focusing uh, self and uh, small-scale filamentation. Uh, now, uh, 
This is leading myself into the very last topic here. A breakup of ring beams carrying orbital angular momentum. Actually, this was the announced that was the announced title of the talk today. So I, I was able to get orbital angular momentum into the talk. So Firth and Scriabin predicted that ring-shaped beams in a saturable care medium are unstable to azimuthal instabilities. And they will break, uh, uh, an OAM of M will tend to break up into 2M filaments, although under certain circumstances it might be uh, 2M plus 1. So uh, here are our experimental results uh, for M equals 1, 2, and 3. And you can see this is broken up into two spots. This is broken up into four spots. This is broken up into six spots. Well, it's cleaner in the numerical simulation. Isn't life always that way? But, uh, but you can see that the beam has broken up. So, so uh, OAM carrying beams can, be, can become unstable. They're unstable to the growth of azimuthal instabilities. And the question is, what can we do about that? And, uh, and then this is the very last topic. So, so this is a collaboration with, uh, with Ebrahim Karimi, a uh, bunch of our students here, postdoc Israel de Leon, and a group at the University of Glasgow, and one person at the University of Naples. So it's called Nonlinear Evolution of Space Varying Polarized Light Beams. So, uh, so the question is, if you use a light beam in which the polarization varies as a function of position, does that, is that a way that you can try to avoid this instability? So uh, this is just very introductory, uh, reminding you about the orbital angular momentum states of light. Uh, L equals zero would be like a Gaussian beam. L equals plus one, minus one. Uh, this carries h bar units of angular momentum. This carries twice h bar units of angular momentum uh, per, per photon. Uh, so the, the question is if you take one of these beams, send it through some nonlinear material, in our case, a rubidium vapor, what happens? Uh, does the beam break up? Does it not break up? So, uh, so first of all, how would you model? Uh, this sort of process. Well, in the linear case, you just have the paraxial wave equation. Uh, uh, for the nonlinear case, you just add the nonlinear term on the right hand side. And here we're modeling this as a saturable nonlinearity. So this would be your standard chi 3 or n2 type of nonlinear response. Here in the denominator, we show that as the intensity gets large, you tend to saturate. The, the nonlinear response. And uh, here are some, uh, uh, I want to give credit. Who actually did the simulation? Ugo. Ugo. Yeah. Uh, so so here, here are some simulations. These, these are just so pretty, I had to show them, e even if it's not entirely needed uh, for, for the, uh, so all the sorts of processes that we've talked about already can just come out of a numerical integration of, uh, of this very simple nonlinear Schrodinger equation. Students, do you now know why I insisted that you learn Mathematica? <laughs> you can do these things on your own. Uh, okay, so, uh, well, uh, once again, uh, if you send one of these OAM beams through a nonlinear material, it will tend to break up. Uh, and here the beam breaks up into two lobes. Question is, is there anything we can do to prevent this from happening? And, the, and, we're going, and, and here's the answer. We're going to use structured or space varying polarized light beams. So uh, let me give you an example. Let's say you have left-hand circular light with an OAM of minus one and you add it to right-hand circular light with an OAM of plus one, and if you just uh, go through the calculation, you'll end up with a radially polarized beam of light. If instead you phase shift one 
by 90 degrees with respect to the other, you end up with a spiral polarization of, of the beam of light. So here we had L and minus L. But of course, there are other possibilities. You can take L equals 0 and mix it with L equals plus 1. Again, left hand, right handed. And you get this sort of strange distribution that some people think looks like a lemon. I don't, but they do. They're smart people. Uh, and if you take L equals 0 and mix it with minus 1, you get still a different distribution that you can call a star distribution. And that maybe does look like a star. Uh, so now, how do, you mo how do you model this? Well, now you have two coupled beams. You have the right-hand component and the left-hand component. So now you have to modify these equations still further to show that the left-hand component is, uh, there's a self-modulation term and a cross-modulation term, where the right-hand circular component of the light modifies the propagation of the left-hand circular polarization of the light. Uh, so, uh, so we did the experiment. Uh, 780 nanometer laser, half wave plate becomes circularly polarized. Uh, we can, well, with a combination of wave plates and something called a Q plate that I think we <coughs> talked about earlier, you, uh, you can form, uh, you, you can form any one of these beams. Uh, in fact, by changing the voltage to the Q plate, you can determine exactly the form of this linear position, superposition. You then pass it through the uh, rubidium cell. So uh, this is a polarizer. This is the analyzer. So then you have some complicated distribution coming out here. You let just one polarization through the system. You measure it. You let another polarization come through. You measure that. And you, end, you see what you end up with. And uh, this is what you end up with. And just this morning, I added the words experimental results. I'm, well, they did the work, not me. This data is so beautiful that you would think that this was theory if I didn't tell you that these were laboratory results. So, but let's, so uh, for the input, you can have radial, azimuthal, spiral, or the pure OAM. You look at the output of the cell, pretty much the same, pretty much the same, pretty much the same different. So all three of these uh, more complicated uh, vector beams uh, show increased stability. So indeed, you can increase the stability. This might be important. There are people who want to put huge amounts of power through the atmosphere. And by using proper polarization encoding, you can hold off this uh, self-focusing uh, in instability a, a, a bit longer. Uh, well, uh, technically, these are vector beams. These are called Poincaré beams. And uh, we, uh, with the same conclusion, that both the lemon and the star Poincaré beam is stable upon propagation. So uh, here's the conclusion. Uh, well, I've said it a few times already. For a pure OAM beam, the beam breaks up. Both for the vector beam and the Poincaré beam, you get stable propagation. And now I just want to finish up very quickly a more personal attribute here. You've heard me for three straight lectures of this sort. And now it's time for me to tell you a little bit about myself. So. Uh, we all sort of wonder where we came from. And I'd always wondered what the name Boyd means. Where does, what, where does the name come from? I was visiting Glasgow, and Alice and Yao uh, said, you don't know what your name means? I said, I thought you were an educated person. I said, no. I said, Boyd is Gaelic for man from Butte. Butte is that island next to Glasgow. So Boyd means man. It's the genitive of Butte. So I said, well, Allison, you wouldn't lie to me. But uh, I wanted some verification. And then we were out uh, 
uh, we're out on a, a drive in the country. Here is me taking a picture of this sign. <laughs> and here it says, Isle Boyd, Isle of Butte Ferry. Okay, so here is the demonstration that my name does mean something like man from Boyd, man, man, man from Butte Island. Uh, and of course, uh, I do have an appointment at the University of Glasgow, and so <coughs> to make sure that I fit in when I'm in Glasgow, I always wear my kilt outfit. So thank you very much. <laughs> If I had thought of it, I could have worn the kilt today. <laughs> you ask a oh, of course, of course. Yep. Maybe it's something obvious, but uh, is there an intuitive reason why a way of being of charge n would break up into two n Oh. Uh, if you ask how many petals are there, well, if you take if you take m and minus m and say how many petals are there, there's two m of them, uh, and maybe the, the instability involves forming a little bit of the complementary. Uh, we could read Firth and Scriabin. Oh, the theoret the theoretical prediction was Willie Firth, and uh, I'm not good at Russian names. Scriabin, I forget his first name now. You know? So, so we could read their paper. We could read their paper and try to figure out why this is so. I mean, it's funny that this work of mine from, uh, whatever, 15 years ago seems much more relevant to me now than it was when I did it at the time. I mean, I mean, I've, I mean that was sort of the first thing I ever done with OAM. And now, uh, and now I've sort of immersed myself into the OAM community. But good question. Sam, you can go home and think about it and report to me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not in, in your, not in your class anymore. <laughs> yeah. No, I meant as part of your research. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, how do you produce more than two entangled photons? Oh. Uh, uh, the, you, can, you can hope that you can go one up and three down. But basically, so, so there are two ways. The, th the first way, I'm not sure if, if it has ever worked. Maybe Robert would know uh, where you just do this. You send in one photon and three come out with this sort of process here. Many people are... Many people are talking about doing it. Uh, many people are trying actively to do it. Philip Russell and Masha uh, is working on this. Does anybody know if this has ever been seen? This has oh. never been done. They call it fluorescence. Masha calls it fluorescence. Calls it what? Fluorescence. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So here's the way that the, here's the way here's the here's the clean way of doing it, which has never been made to work. Here is the way that has been made to work. You take an intense laser beam and you excite the crystal and then you get two entangled photons out. And then you take this photon and you put it into still another nonlinear crystal and you get two photons out here. So then you have your three photons. And you would send it to a uh, three input coincidence circuit. Uh, trouble is that this beam is very weak, so the the rate of this is very small. One, Robert, one per hour? More. No, they got way higher than that. More than that. Yeah, now they have, I guess, that's good detectors. We'll bring in images by detectors first, first rate. So how many? How, what? One per second. One per second. Kevin Resch? Yeah. Well, it's the people at Waterloo. Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, who's also from yeah, uh, who's also from. I said the people from uh, Waterloo because I I knew I couldn't pronounce Genevan, <laughs> and neither can you I think. <laughs> Yenavine, Yenavine, Yenavine. Use what? To do what? Tell us how. 
or this is such a great secret, you, want to, you, you probably want to patent this first. <laughs> you, you generate two pairs and then you mix two? Yeah. Well, I mean, and, and then the four are entangled if you do it right. If you do it right, yeah. Oh, you mean, yeah. You didn't mean to form no, no, using no, purely linear optics. You can get around this, uh, you know, cascading. Yeah. So, you get, yeah, so you get two of them, and that, uh, that, which is how they do quantum teleportation and all that. Yeah, yeah. yeah, so, so, yeah. So, so you do this, but the count rates t tend to go very, very low. Somebody, somebody was, had a hand up. No? I was you. Say we're actually trying to do something like this in the lab. Mm -hmm. It's three entangled, yes. So it's three entangled photons. Yeah. So you generate two. Puts through each of them to a beam splitter and the third one to a beam splitter. And if you get the whole mando in each of them, then the three of them will be in the panel. You say it again and I'll draw the picture. So you have two photons coming out through. Uh, okay. So you have two photons coming out. Yeah. You send each of these to another crystal? Yeah, to, to, to a beam splitter. Wait. That's, that's a beam splitter. Just a beam splitter. Where? Each of these comes through a beam splitter. So we have something like this. And same thing down here? Right. Okay. Okay. And you have a third photon going through both beam splitters. Where does the third photon come from? Um, can come from anywhere. Okay. As long as the same wavelengths. Okay. But a single photon. A single photon. Okay, so so so. Well, you can create another like. Right, so so we know how to make single photons. Okay, so you take the single photon, and you do what? And you send it through the two beams with the You send a, you send one photon either through here or here. No, from the top, from the top, through both. From here. Okay. Mm -hmm. And that's a beam slitter. Yeah. Mm. So if you get oh. yeah, so if you get the timing right, this photon will arrive at the same time as that, and arrive at the same time as that, then mm -hmm. this here will be entangled. Okay. Oh four four photon entanglement then? Three. Oh wait, wait. Three. These are aligned. These are aligned so that this photon after it passes through yes. here goes through here. Yeah. Uh, it's worth thinking through. It's, it's, it seems reminiscent of things that we've heard before. So thank you. We'll, we'll, thank you. We'll think this one through. Any other questions? No? Thank you very much. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. Yeah. We're still not done. Yet. Yeah. We're okay. still not done. <laughs> Has everybody um, <coughs> figured for the Rockwell?